All right, I'm going to get started here. Uh, I was looking at the slides. I know I said this is not going to be on the test. However, I believe it behooves you to know this information anyway. And it's a good kind of starter for getting into thinking about the drugs we're going to cover in farm. And it's only 18 slides, so I got time to cover it. Um, so we'll do this real quick, and then we'll go into the Kahoot review. Uh, and that should prepare you for the test. Uh, you want to do well on that because the winner gets one free test answer. It's a highly coveted free test answer. So just keep that in the back of your mind, right? Some people give out candy. I say no. Let's give out knowledge. <laughs> can you share? I don't know what you're going to do that information once you have it. Who can say? Right, it's outside of my hands at that point. Wow, it's powerful, powerful stuff. Anywho. Um, so any questions from stuff we covered last time regarding like, how to write your prescriptions and the requirements thereof, uh, anything like that? We'll get into more details on some of the specifics uh, when it comes into, um, you know, different types of prescriptions you might be writing. And you'll see that, you know, we're starting off with pretty basic oral medications here. But as we get into form one and two, you'll find that we'll get into different dosage forms. So that way, like, we'll talk about how to actually like, dose insulin, how to write for uh, injectable products, how to write for inhalers and things like that, just to give you a little bit more uh, perspective on how to do those different dosage forms, because uh, it can be a little bit tricky. And sometimes things are kind of specific to one form or another. Anyway, let's talk about our autonomic nervous system. You guys have covered this in physio before, right? Now let's take this concept and kind of apply it to how drugs are going to be interacting with this. And you're like, it's just the autonomic nervous system. There's so much more to the body than just that. How important can it be? The answer being extremely, extremely. right. Extremely right. You're going to find that this is a very important um, part of how drugs are going to interact with the body and also how the body's going to interact back with those drugs, right? Because again, homeostasis is always the name of the game. Your body's trying to counteract a lot of times what the drugs are doing to an extent. And this is one of the processes for helping with that, as we'll see. Right. So the two main versions of the autonomic nervous system, we have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Sympathetic is just what? Yeah, sympathetic is your fight or flight response. Again, I always use the um, example of a bear jumped out of the closet and tried to attack us. Like That's your fight or flight response. If I had you come up here and give a talk all of a sudden impromptu, you'd probably have your flight or flight response. Maybe an alligator comes and gets you while you're running around uh, the lake in the morning. Who knows, right? It could be anything. Um, the parasympathetic is also termed as... <coughs> You rest and digest, right? So you're just kind of hanging out, not really doing much. Maybe you had some breakfast before you came in here. That's more likely to be your rest and digest, kind of kicking in there. Um, the main neurotransmitter we're dealing with with the parasympathetic is what? Acetylcholine, right? So acetylcholine acts on what type of receptors when you're dealing with the parasympathetic system? Muscarinic. Anyone know where that muscarinic name comes from? You said muscarin, you'd be correct. Anyone know where muscarin comes from? Muskrats, perhaps? Do you know? That's the smell they give off. It's actually from a mushroom. There's a mushroom called the Amanita muscaria. If you look it up, it's actually um, it's the red cat mushroom with the white specks on it, kind of like Mario. Exactly. Why, that was. why was that picture there? Right. That was actually because those are my slides, and then we yeah. he adapted them, so you might not have had any context on it. But that is why I put that on there because it's the Amanita muscaria, and there's actually a, a compound in there called muscarin that interacts with the parasympathetic nervous system and actually directly stimulate that. And so actually, when you think about Mario, right, the plumber, what happens when he eats one of those mushrooms? Super Mario. He gets become super Mario. Yeah, he gets big, right? So again, you're expanding his mind and his body by consuming mushrooms, right? So it's actually been used for hallucinogenic properties before, right? So again, he kind of puts a whole new spin on, on Mario. He's really just tripping out the whole time. It's kind of interesting. Anywho, maybe some lead poisoning from all the lead pipes he deals with. Who can say? Anywho, so the parasympathetic, right, acetylcholine, we're going to find that also nicotinic receptors play a big role here as well. We mentioned nicotinic gets activated by what was the first thing we found that activates that? Nicotine, right? So it makes good sense. Um, the sympathetic, however, what was the main neurotransmitter there? There's epi and norepi. Primarily for the sympathetic nervous system, epi, or I'm sorry, norepi is going to be the main neurotransmitter that actually gets released from those neurons. However, also think about the fact that the adrenal glands are going to be uh, involved with this as well. What's the main neurotransmitter left, or I guess more, more like a hormone released from the adrenal glands that are having to do with the sympathetic nervous system? So cortisol, yes, is going to be one of those responses, but more specifically to our purposes, epi is going to be the other thing, right? Epinephrine gets released in a higher proportion from the adrenal glands, nor epi is going to be more likely released from these nerve terminals uh, for the actual sympathetic nerves. And I'll show you a picture of that that makes more sense. Now, the main 
receptors that we're going to be dealing with with the sympathetic nervous system is what? Your alphas and your betas, right? So alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, and beta 2 are the big ones, right? There's also like beta 3 receptors, and there's other varieties, subgenres of the beta receptors. Uh, we're not going to worry about those. For our purposes, alpha 1 and 2, beta 1 and 2 are the big ones, okay? And we'll get into more details on what they do specifically. So when you're looking at how the autonomic nervous system is functioning, right, you have to think about um, kind of where the different neurotransmitters are getting involved, where the different actual receptors are at. And you'll, what you'll actually notice here in that both of them, nicotinic receptors are really important, right? Nicotinic receptors help to stimulate sort of the interconnections there with that autonomic nervous system. Where else are nicotinic receptors really important? Mm -hmm, the skeletal muscle, right? That's actually what stimulates the skeletal muscle to actually contract is when you have those nicotinic receptors being activated there. So when looking at this, you can see here that, say, for instance, you have your spinal cord that is sending out the signal from the auto, for the autonomic nervous system here. Notice here this kind of presynaptic signal here is going to be a nicotinic receptor. Right? It's going to hit this ganglion, and then that will then stimulate muscarinic receptors at the actual tissue. So already you can see there's kind of two sites where medications could be actually playing a role here. So for instance, I could do things to either block receptors here at the tissues. Thus, I would decrease the parasympathetic tone, as we say, right? So how active it is. Um, I could do things like increasing the amount of acetylcholine. That would then stimulate those receptors, right? You get more activity. Or I could actually affect it here at the nicotinic receptors as well. So if I were to increase the amount of acetylcholine here, what would that do? Yeah, you would stimulate those nicotinic receptors unless you get a stronger parasympathetic response, okay? Now again, what is that response? We'll get into it, right? There's mnemonics we use to remember this stuff, and that's why it's so important to get into it. But looking at the sympathetic side of things, you're going to see here that, yes, the ganglion is closer to the spinal cord. Not really important for our purposes here, but notice here it's still a nicotinic receptor getting activated first, right? So acetylcholine can still play a big role here if it gets altered due to the effects of substances, right? And we'll talk about a few examples of that. Now, you can see here that the uh, nicotinic receptors will directly stimulate the adrenal glands, right? So you're going to mainly get a lot more epi than you do norepi. Uh, but the other big things you're going to find is that, yes, you do get a lot of norepi being released here onto these alpha and beta receptors, and that's where you're going to see the main sympathetic effects, right? Your fight-or-flight responses that you're going to be seeing there. Um, now, again, you're also going to find maybe a little bit of muscarinic receptors being hit here. That's mainly for your sweat glands, because normally if you get really... Um, ramped up and you're having a big test come up, you know, normally are you nice and dry? You tend to get sweaty, right? Because again, you're going to be hot. You're going to try to dissipate that heat. That's part of that. But this is more of a minor process. We're going to mainly focus on the effects of that norepi and what that does for us. Now, looking at this, where do we get acetylcholine from? And basically, it's pretty simple. You get it from acetyl-CoA and choline. They come together to form acetylcholine. I think the actual pronunciation is acetylcholine. I had this one professor in college that was always be like, acetylcholine. And I thought it sounded silly. I say acetylcholine. We'll keep it at that. Now, how does it get broken down? Acetylcholinesterase, right? So it's an enzyme that will actually break this down into uh, acetate and choline. The choline actually gets recycled back into the neuron. You're going to find that's a common process, right? We like to reduce, reuse, and recycle as much as we can. And so we can take that choline and we can put it back into the uh, into a vesicle in the, uh, the neuron. We can then recycle that back into acetylcholine and get better use out of it, right? Anyway, so this enzyme here is really important. So what would happen if I were to, say, decrease the activity of acetylcholinesterase? I'd have more acetylcholine around, which means I would have a stronger response out of things like the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Because there's just more of it around to activate those receptors. On the flip side, you're going to have on the, the sympathetic side, you're going to have what we call our catecholamines. Have you guys heard that term before? What's catecholamines refer to? Norepi, epi. Actually, dopamine falls in that category as well, right? Dopamine, norepine, and epithelium. Those are three really important neurotransmitters that are considered to be our catecholamines. It has to do with like, their chemical structure. So how do they actually get formed here? Well, one, we're going to see that tyrosine is going to be a precursor molecule. Where do we get a lot of tyrosine from? Mostly our diet, right? So you're going to see that gets converted into L-dopa. It's levodopa. So you ever see that? When we talk about Parkinson's, this is going to be a really important uh, compound you're going to see there. Levodopa gets turned into dopamine. And then that eventually gets turned to, to norepinephrine. Now, what does dopamine help us do? It's really important for two main things. We're going to see that motion is really important, right? It's so actually um, kicking off a lot of the more kind of um, intricate motor patterns in the brain, right? If you look back at that substantia nigra, remember going through that at all? Your CNS talk, right? Dopamine's super important there. In fact, when you have someone with Parkinson's, what is Parkinson's? 
all those dopamine neurons get destroyed, you have less dopamine, and guess what they have a hard time doing? Initiating movements, right? They get that shuffling gait, they get that pill rolling, they get uh, dysarthria, they have a whole lot of issues of actually initiating movements, and a lot of it has to do with that lack of dopamine. So that's one really important purpose. The other really big one you think about in terms of dopamine is what else? In terms of me, someone who deals with people that overdose on drugs a lot. Addiction, absolutely. So there's that reward pathway, and dopamine is really important for that, right? So if you have like a nice juicy hamburger, if you have a nice big hit of heroin, if you uh, <laughs> attend my class, you get a big squirt of dopamine, right? And you get that reward pathway stimulated and say, wow, I really want to do that again. I think I'm going to come back and get more of that class. That was a really good class, right? <laughs> I should more, I get more like that, that amygdala fear response more than anything else. But um, as it stands, you get a lot of that dopamine there. And that's where addiction really comes from in a lot of big ways. Some people are wired for certain things to trigger that more than others. That's why you get people with food addiction, uh, nicotine addiction, opioid addiction, etc. cetera. Um, that's where that comes from. But know that dopamine is a precursor to norepi, right? So what you're going to find is that uh, most of it gets re-uptaken by, or, uh, re-uptaken by the presynaptic neuron, which means we recycle a lot of that. But some of it left over in, in that nerve terminal right between the two neurons, you're going to find actually gets metabolized by a couple of different enzymes. One of them is called catecholamine O-methyltransferase, or COM-T. What would happen if I inhibited the activities of COM-T, you think? You actually end up increasing that level of dopamine and also epi and norepinephrine, right? You actually have increased levels because you have decreased metabolism, okay? Same thing, there's one called monoamine oxidase, MAO. This is actually really important for metabolizing serotonin. And what does serotonin do for us? What's one of the main purposes in the brain? Makes us happy, right? More serotonin, you get more happy, right? Probably more complicated than that. We don't really know the full mechanism. But generally speaking, by increasing levels of serotonin, that's how we treat depression and anxiety, essentially. And so we actually used to use monoamine oxidase inhibitors to increase people's levels of serotonin, and that tended to treat their depression, right? We'll talk all about that in the psych section later on here. But by inhibiting these enzymes, you can see how you can up the levels of a lot of these neurotransmitters. And sometimes that's a good thing for therapeutic purposes. In other cases, this is going to turn into toxicity, okay? So you got to be careful with that stuff. Anyway, in the adrenal medulla, that's when you have norepi get turned into epinephrine, and that's where that conversion comes from. Okay, so let's look at the kind of main effects you're going to see in terms of organ system involvement with parasympathetic and sympathetic. This is really important for me and my purposes as a toxicologist because when I have patients come in who have maybe overdosed on a substance, either on purpose or inadvertently, um, are they frequently going to be like completely upfront and honest about what they've done? Generally, no, right? How do I tell if a you know, poison patient's lying? Their lips are moving essentially, right? So I can tell based on that, I'm going to be 100% truthful. Again, it's a cynical view to take, but after years of doing what I do, it, it's true. Um, also, patients may not have the mental status to actually be able to communicate what happened, right? Some of them may be seen as depressed enough or altered enough where they just really can't communicate. And again, I have to go off of basically what the patient's showing me are in terms of signs and symptoms. What is their vital signs doing? Like, what do their pupils look like? What do their bowel sounds sound like? And that tells me a lot about what sort of substances they may be exposed to, and then that informs how I'm going to treat that patient, right? So just like you guys come up with a differential for belly pain, I do the same thing for these poison patients, right? So anyway, so getting, and you'll have to do this too if you work in the ER or the ICU and you're dealing with these sorts of patients. Um, so first off, starting with the eyes. So in terms of the effects of the eyes, the rest and digest sort of standpoint, what do you think you see? You see pupillary constriction, right? Why is that? I don't need a whole lot of light coming in. I just had a big meal. I'm kind of chilling around. I think about after like Thanksgiving dinner, do I really care about seeing my cousins doing whatever, my aunt or uncle? I don't really care, right? So I don't need a ton of light in. So I get, what do you call that when you have that pupillary constriction? Meiosis, right? So you see meiosis happen there. What else might you see? Remember that the parasympathetic, uh, parasympathetic nervous system, you're going to get secretions basically coming from everywhere. So one of the big things you can find by stimulating that system is actually you can see lacrimation. So if you had a patient who's tearing excessively and they're, I'm like, what's so sad? And they're like, I'm not sad. I'm just, I can't stop this. It could be drug related, right? You can actually see that as a result of that. Um, so those are big things you can see. Also, um, by inhibiting the system, what would happen? By inhibiting the, uh, the effects of acetylcholine at these muscarinic receptors, you see the opposite effects, right? So it's important not to only know what they actually do when they're activated, but what happens when you deactivate them as well. So what might you expect to see? So if not meiosis, we would see mydriasis, right? So if I have someone who is accidentally overdosed on an anticholinergic, frequently they come with big saucer-looking pupils, right? Because they're having that acetylcholine being blocked, and so you see that relaxation of those muscles. 
of the, the uh, circular muscles there, and so they get nice and wide. There's, um, if you watch the movie uh, Requiem for a Dream, it's probably a little bit outside of your guys' age range in terms of movies you're watching when you're like six. I would not recommend watching that movie while you're that young. Um, but if you get a chance, go back and watch that movie. It's very depressing um, in terms of talking about drug abuse and, and, and addiction, but it was one of the really interesting things they do is anytime the, the, the um, as a patients, but anytime the actors, they're shooting up medications, you'll get a really big close-up view of their, their pupils. And you can actually see whether they're getting myosis or they're getting midriatic and actually goes back and it's generally pretty accurate in terms of the drugs they're, they're abusing there. Anywho, um, you'll find I have a big movie recommendation list in terms of uh, drugs and things like that as we go forward. That's one of them I would recommend watching if you get a chance. Um, you'll definitely never want to abuse drugs after that, watching that movie horrible um anyway so um other things you can see right so accommodation is going to be affected there so actually being able to change the shape of the lens so oftentimes patients may be complaining of blurry vision associated with this um either activation or deactivation of the system okay looking at the sympathetic fight or flight response what would you see happen Yeah, I see pupillary, pupillary dilation, right? So if you ever see someone who's done a whole bunch of cocaine, again, they're going to have those really big saucer-looking pupils because they have had the activation of those radial muscles that are pulling that pupil open, right? So that's mid mydriasis you can see there. Now, when do you think this might be useful to cause this meiosis or mydriasis? Hundred percent, yeah. So we actually will use medications that actually affect the system here directly to try to open up the pupil, so that way we can actually get a good view of the retina, right? So we do this a lot for our ophthalmo ophthalmologic exams. Um, we can either use an anticholinergic to try to open up the pupil, or we can use a something that directly stimulates norepinephrine receptors, the alpha receptors that are causing this, and that will actually help them to to get a better view, right? So we you can see how we use medications specifically to interact with the system to be able to get a better view and make our exams better, okay? So typically, and, and you're going to find that when you're looking at the parasympathetic nervous system, there's, you know, M2, M1, M3 receptors. I don't really care, you know, the, the, the differentiations between those necessarily because they ultimately kind of do most of the same thing. And clinically, it doesn't matter. However, uh, when it comes to the sympathetic, you shouldn't know kind of the effects of the alpha, beta receptor differences between the two, right? So in general, alpha receptors do what? They basically constrict, right? So looking at smooth muscle activity, they basically constrict smooth muscles. So in the eyes, that makes sense that it would cause mydriasis because they're constricting that smooth, the smooth radial muscles and causing that pupil to open up, right? Generally, alpha ones are going to cause constriction of the smooth muscle. That also is going to make sense when we look at what it does for the blood pressure, right? And we look at the cardiovascular system here. Um, you'll also find they can help with far vision as well because again, we want a lot, a lot of light coming in. We want to be able to see far, so I can look for danger, right? So that's why it's part of that fight or flight response. And typically, beta two activation is going to do what to the smooth muscle? It's going to relax. Okay, so alpha one constricts smooth muscle. Typically, beta two will relax. Think about beta two agonists like albuterol in the lungs. When you have an asthma attack and all that bronchial smooth muscle is really constricted and you can't move air. You give them that, hits those beta-2 receptors, and it relaxes, and they can breathe better, right? So, again, a lot of this will make sense when you kind of think about the activities of the, in, uh, the actual receptors individually. Okay, on the heart, typically for the parasympathetic nervous system, what, what are you going to see? Otherwise known as? Bradycardia, right? So again, it's more important for that because when we get to the mnemonics, it's going to help you to remember those. Um, mainly, you're going to find that the muscarinic receptors are going to be on the AV and SA node, and they tend to slow down the heart rate, right, more than anything else. They have a little bit of effect on contractility, but the main thing is going to be on, on the actual heart rate itself. Um, on the flip side, though, you see the sympathetic effects. What do you see? Why do you see tachycardia associated with that? I need to run away from something, so I need to be able to pump that blood around to oxygenate the muscles so I can get moving, right? So you're going to typically see increased contractility, increased heart rate associated with that, increased cardiac output overall. And that's mainly due to what sort of uh, receptor effects? Beta 1, right? You got one heart, you got two lungs. So I remember beta 1 versus beta 2. Beta 1 receptors in the main thing is going to stimulate the heart into increasing that chronotropy, which is what? actual heart rate, the speed of the heart rate, uh, and then also the inotropy, which is contractility, right? How strong the heart's actually beating there. Good. Um, so what would happen if I gave an anticholinergic, what would you see with the heart rate? See it go up, actually, right? So again, if you're activating those muscarinic receptors, you're going to slow down the heart. Presumably, if you block those receptors, you would see 
increase heart rate. If you ever are part of a code, you're in a, in a code red situation where the patient is uh, in cardiac arrest, one of the drugs you'll have available is atropine. Have you heard of the drug atropine before? What does that do? It blocks muscarinic receptors and will cause the heart rate to go up, hopefully. So you can use it for symptomatic bradycardia. Oh, one other thing I meant, uh, meant to mention. You guys ever heard of the belladonna alkaloids? They're a group of plants um, that actually uh, are anti-muscarinic in nature. And so people, you know, belladonna means in, in, uh, in Italian. It's pretty beautiful woman, pretty lady, right? So um, they used to actually put those in their eyes to cause mydriasis because I thought that look was like very beautiful at the time. Um, so if you ever see that belladonna alkaloids, it's referring to that. They would basically put atropine drops essentially into their eyes. Um, nowadays, if you like went on a date and someone showed up and they had pupils that looked like super dilated, what would you think? I said, I'm not going to, I'm getting off tender after this. Like, this is, they are obviously on drugs. No, thank you. Um, but again, times change. So I did a beauty to, to, to shift. Um, okay. Looking at the blood vessels, right? So kind of continuing on the cardiovascular effects. Typically with the parasympathetic, no real direct effects. So there's nothing really to think about here in terms of either causing hypotension, hypertension, anything like that. However, sympathetic, super important here. And so again, the question is, uh, depending on your fight or flight response, where is blood really needed to go to? Do you want to, yeah, you just want to supply the heart, where else? The muscles, right, very good. Uh, do I need to worry about supplying a lot of blood to, say, the GI tract? Yeah. No, right? So, again, your body will shift where the blood's going depending on where it's needed, uh, de depending on the situation. So when the sympathetic really gets kicked into overdrive, tend to find that areas like, uh, for instance, the GI tract gets sh blood shunted away from it, right? Uh, how about the kidneys? What do you think? They have increased or decreased blood flow? Actually, decreased as well, right? Again, I can survive without my kidneys for a little bit. I can survive without the GI tract functioning for, uh, for a little bit. But the muscles need to be moving, right? The heart needs to be perfused. The brain needs to be perfused. So these are the things you're going to be focusing on here. And that's why you have this balance between alpha-1 and beta-2 effects. We said alpha-1 typically does what? Constricts smooth muscles. So you'd expect to do what, uh, see what with the blood pressure? Should go up, right? So you're going to see an increase in blood pressure. You can see hypertension. And again, it will decrease flow by constricting flow to certain non-essential areas, right? So you can see um, where you can cut off blood flow to the GI tract. Now, is that that's okay for a short period of time. How about for the long term? Is that good? No. So actually what you can see is, um, and sometimes in the hospital when we have patients with low blood pressure, we'll give them norepinephrine or we'll give them epinephrine to try to raise their blood pressure back up. In the long term, what do you think that does to those non-essential organs? They start to not be perfused as well. You can see kidney injury due to this right? Because you're lacking enough oxygen to really pr uh, provide for them. You can see mesenteric ischemia due to that because that blood flow has been shut off and you get necrosis, lead to bowel perforations and things like that. It's no good. So this is why you have to kind of carry this with a, you know, uh, walk that fine line between making sure we're getting our blood pressure right so we can perfuse the heart and the head and essential organs and, and also not cutting off flow to those other areas. So to help with that, we have the beta-2 receptors and those typically causes what? Yeah, smooth muscle relaxation, and when you do that around the blood vessels, you can see some degree of blood pressure lowering. So actually one of the effects you can see by giving uh, a beta-2 agonist, like if you give way too much albuterol, you can actually see that they get hypotensive because it's activating those beta-2 receptors, causing it to dilate, and thus you can see lower blood pressure. <coughs> okay, so kind of keep that in mind between those two effects there. And again, we'll find certain substances that only act to alpha receptors. We'll find certain substances that only act to beta receptors. Okay. Now, what would happen if I had something that blocked alpha-1 receptors? What do you think you'd see? Dilation, which would lead to? Low blood pressure, hypotension, right? What happens when you have hypotension? What does your heart rate like to do to compensate for that? And go up, right? Good. What happens if a patient stands up from a sitting position and they have an alpha blocker on board? They get really dizzy, right? They have that orthostatic hypotension, right? So you're going to start to see some of these side effects start to line up in terms of how the actual drugs are working. So again, if I know I'm affecting the blood pressure, lowering the blood pressure, oftentimes you're going to see dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, falls associated with these, especially in your elderly patients. Because we said their hemodynamic reserves going down anyway, right? So these are things you're going to be finding with these drugs. And that's, that's why it's so important to know this stuff so well, the autonomic nervous system, because so many drugs are going to be interacting with it. Okay, looking at the lungs, you're going to find that with the parasympathetic nervous system um, activating these muscarinic receptors, we mentioned that muscarinic receptors typically cause a lot of secretions to be released, right? So in this case, you're going to see mostly that we're going to have some bronchial smooth muscle constriction, which ultimately, you know, again, if you think about that rest and digest sort of standpoint, you know, your oxygen demand is probably not going to be super high, so I don't need to be breathing big, huge gulps of breath, right? So it's okay if I have some smooth muscle constriction there. But the other thing is these bronchial secretions that get generated, right? So why do we want mucus in the lungs? Why is that good? 
will trap particles and bacteria, and then we have that mucociliary clearance, right? And then we can get rid of that stuff, okay? So we need some secretions. What happens if it were to have way too many secretions and fill up? Bad or good? Bad, right? Because again, then you can't oxygenate because all those alveoli are just filled with fluid, filled with mucus, and you can't get rid of it, right? Uh, if you ever look at like a CF patient, a cystic fibrosis patient, that very thick, tenacious secretions, they have a really hard time oxygenating because they get all their alveoli kind of clogged up with the, this mucus, right? So that's one thing you're going to see there. On the flip side, for the sympathetic effects, it's mainly just going to be beta 2. Mainly you're going to see that smooth muscle relaxation. You should see better air movement. You should see easier breathing, right? So if you have someone who's wheezing, because they have asthma and they have that bronchial smooth muscle constriction, you can give them a beta 2 agonist and that will help to relax that muscle and they should be able to breathe better. Anyone know how we test for asthma? Yes, yeah, so you can do like PFTs. That can help you out. What else can we do? Oh, actually, one thing I can do is I can I can give them an asthma attack. How you do that, right? Well, I can basically stimulate these muscarinic receptors. There's something called methacholine. Sounds like acetylcholine, and basically it'll stimulate those receptors and causing that smooth muscle constriction. For people who have reactive airway disease or airways are very reactive, they will end up having that bronchoconstriction. I'll give them the FEV1 test, right? They'll do that. They'll see a decrease, and I know that okay, they have really high bronchial responsiveness. They have asthma essentially, and then how do I fix it? So I can either give them a beta-2 agonist, I give them an albuterol afterwards, because it's not nice to like give someone an asthma attack and then just leave them wheezing there. It's generally not good for them. So I can reverse it with a beta-2 agonist. Or what else could I do? I can use an anticholinergic, right? So if you ever hear like a duoneb or you ever hear like atrovent, that's actually an antimuscarinic that will then reverse those effects there, right? So there's different ways we can interact with the system, right? Either stimulating one or deactivating the other one, right? Because remember that tone between the two, there's always some activation of either of those uh, nervous systems. Again, it's not like one, you're always 100% one or the other. There's generally going to be a tone between the two, right? That's how we can interact with them. Okay, for the GI tract, what do you think we see with the rest and digest? More blood flow, what else? More secretions, stimulation of digestion, essentially, right? Peristalsis is also going to be stimulated when you're doing this as well, right? So we're going to see that the sphincter tone is going to relax in a lot of cases. You're going to see movement uh, increase throughout the GI tract. How, do you, how could you tell that on physical exam? Some from bowel sounds, right? It should be hyperactive, right? If you ever hear someone right after they get a nice big meal, you're going to hear that, right? You're going to hear their, all the gurgles and, and rumblies and all that kind of good stuff. And you're going to know that increased bowel sounds could be related back to the acetylcholine effect. Um, what might you see if you were to, say, put the parasympathetic into overdrive? Diarrhea, right? Because you have excessive peristalsis. What else? If I'm lowering all those sphincter tones, what else could happen? Well, I can see retrograde movement of stuff and then a emesis, right? So again, these are all things you're going to expect to see. A lot of secretions, a lot of expulsions of things like diarrhea, emesis, etc. And again, that'll make more sense when we get to the, the mnemonic in just a little bit. So that's mainly what you're going to see with parasympathetic. Sympathetic, what do you tend to see? Kind of the opposite effects for the most part. You're going to typically see that the alpha one's going to cause more of the sphincter constriction. Um, again, overall decrease in motility. It's not to say that you can't have people with like, you know, irritable bowel syndrome and things like that where they get really stressed out and they have diarrhea associated with that. It just depends. Um, but again, typically you're going to overall find decrease in, in the tone and activity of the GI tract. How about urinary tract? Kind of the same thing, right? With the parasympathetic, what do you expect to see? Increased urination, right? So again, expect to see a lot of secretions from every orifice, essentially. So increasing that muscarinic effect, you're going to find that the trucer muscles are going to start to clamp down. You're going to cause increase in pressure, which will then hopefully stimulate that, hey, I need to urinate. Um, oftentimes, if you overstimulate this to the point where a patient, it kind of overrides the patient's own in, uh, external sphincter, you can actually find, you know, uh, incontinence can develop because of this. Sometimes they just can't control it because they have so much stimulation there. And then on the flip side, on the, pair, on the sympathetic side, what do you see? So, yeah, so the beta-2 is going to be good because it's actually going to help to relax that detrusor muscle, right? So it allows for better storage, right? Why do, why do we care about better storage of urine in a sympathetic state? Yeah, I don't want to get rid of that blood volume, right? So, again, I don't want to necessarily urinate because that blood volume is good for my blood pressure, and that helps to perfuse the organs I need to perfuse, like the muscles and whatnot. So beta-2 helps with that relaxation of the detrusor muscle, and then alpha-1 does what? It's going to help to constrict that internal urethral sphincter, and, again, helps to prevent urination from occurring, Okay. How about the skin? What do you expect to see with the parasympathetic? 
a lot of secretions, sweating is what you're going to expect to see with this, right? So um, actually, you're going to see uh, just kind of an overall general diaphoresis associated with this, mostly due to muscarinic effects. Parasympathetic, I'm sorry, sympathetic. Keep flipping around, but the sympathetic side, what are you going to see? You can actually still see secretions, right? Because again, when you're in that fight or flight response, remember we saw in that diagram, there's still some muscarinic activity happening there, uh, mainly due to the fact that when you're in a fight or flight response, your temperature usually does what? goes up, right, and how you dissipate heat with sweat, right? So again, that's part of that process there. So you still see some secretions. You don't expect someone to have like completely dry skin because of that. However, how could I really dry someone's skin out? Like he's an anticholinergic, right? So actually it's one of the big side effects you're going to see. If you want to dry people out and go and decrease secretions, give an anticholinergic. That's one of the best ways to do that. They'll complain a dry mouth, they can't pee, all kind of good stuff, right? All right, and then other miscellaneous sort of effects here. Um, again, Things like the parasympathetic system helps with salivary glands, right? Helping to make more saliva so that way you can eat whatever it is you're going to be uh, consuming there. And then other effects you're going to see with the sympathetic, mainly going to be due to beta-2 effects. You can actually see that on the skeletal muscle, you're going to have increased contractility. What do you think that shows up as? Tremors, yeah. So again, think about being really scared in that fight or flight response. You know, you get kind of those tremors. That's due to that increased beta-2 activation there. Also, what happens to my blood glucose in a fight or flight response? Typically, it's going to go up. Why do I want my blood sugar to go up? Because I need more energy, right? So, again, you're going to find that it helps with um, glycogenolysis, right? Glycogenolysis is what? Yeah, change that stored up glycogen back into sugar, so that way I can use that in order to energize the muscles to move, right? Um, also, in the liver, you're going to find that it'll stimulate that glycogenolysis and then gl gluconeogenesis, right? One falls into the other. And then that also really is raise the blood sugar. So that's important because, you know, again, if you find that I'm giving a patient something that is stimulating that fight or flight response and they have diabetes, guess what? Their blood sugar is going to be that much harder to control, right? Because, again, I have something that's directly stimulating that, causing gluconeogenesis, which is not good for someone who has a blood sugar, say, of like 200, right? Okay. Other things. So one other kind of key concept, and I don't know if Professor Kaplan has mentioned it, but it's a term called autoreceptors. Anyone know what autoreceptors means? So essentially, right, remember we talked about, you know, there's there's negative feedback loops. If you imagine, this is a presynaptic neuron, and then you have the postsynaptic neuron, right? Well, and then you have these little vesicles that are going to have all your neurotransmitters in them. Let's say for our instances here, we're going to talk about norepinephrine, right? And so then these are then going to be released into the nerve terminal, and then will stimulate either alpha or beta receptors on that postsynaptic neuron, right? Well, how does the neuron know to stop releasing more neurotransmitters. There's a negative feedback loop, right? So once you kind of fill up the terminal with all these neurotransmitters, eventually enough of it's going to feed back onto these alpha-2 receptors here on the side of the neuron. When you activate that, what does it do? Well, it basically says, hey, we got enough neurotransmitter here. Let's just go ahead and shut down further release. And you're going to find that almost every neurotransmitter has its own autoreceptor that will then decrease further release of those vesicles, OK? Basically, again, it's that negative feedback loop being activated. Say, hey, we got enough. Don't worry about sending that anymore. Okay, that's beneficial because again, this helps to prevent neurotoxicity for these postsynaptic neurons. Right, it helps prevent them from getting overstimulated and having excitotoxicity, uh, but also helps us to make sure we don't run out of our own neurotransmitters. Right, because again, you have a finite amount and it takes time to replenish those. So we have an alpha-2 receptor, and so what would happen if I activated these alpha-2 receptors and I decrease release of norepinephrine? Well, I would see decreased sympathetic tone. How would that manifest? What do you think your blood pressure would do? It would go down, right? Because, again, I have less norepinephrine being released on those alpha-1 receptors on the vascular smooth muscle. What would happen to my heart rate? Go down, right? What do you think would happen to my overall level of stimulation in the brain? Go down, right? So, again, sedation is a common side effect you see with that. So the reason why I mention this is there's a drug called clonidine, Right? I've never heard of clonidine before. It's a it's a antihypertensive. It's used pretty commonly. We use it for all kinds of stuff. And one of the things we use it for is to one help out with things like decreasing heart rate and blood pressure. It's very good for that. But also it helps to decrease a lot of the effects of withdrawal from certain medications. So if I have a baby who's born, gets transferred over to the NICU over at Nemours, and their mom was using drugs throughout the pregnancy, and now they come out and they're withdrawing from those drugs, they get very sympathetic, right? So again, if you imagine someone in a fight or flight response because they need their medications. They need that heroin, they need that cocaine, whatever the mom was abusing, um, they get a lot of fight or flight responses. And so, again, they can 
be a detriment to feeding, weight gain, all kinds of stuff for the baby. And they're just generally very aggravated. So we can actually give them clonidine and that helps to activate those alpha-2 receptors that shuts down further release of norepinephrine to a degree. And then you see they kind of chill out, right? Blood pressure comes down, they're a little bit more calm, and then they can be a little more tolerant to feedings and, and whatnot, right? So again, there's another way we can interact with the system in order to uh, achieve certain therapeutic benefits. Okay, so the mnemonics, right? So these are the kind of the main kind of high yield things you want to remember going forward because you can always fall back on these, right? So the muscarinic mnemonic. Anyone know what the old mnemonic used to be? You maybe took A&P back in college. I guess you're still in college, but you're undergrad college. So it used to be sludge. Sludge would contain most of these, but now it's dumbbells. Dumbbells we like to use much more frequently because because it, it actually contains what we call the killer bees. And so we'll walk through that. So these are what's going to happen if you overstimulate the muscarinic receptors, right? Or what happens when you stimulate them? You're going to expect to see defecation. Why is that? <laughs> Increased peristalsis, right? Exactly. O overstimulate the muscarinic receptors, you're going to see defecation, diarrhea. Uh, you can see urination associated with that. Same reasons, okay? You're going to see meiosis. See some come in the very small pupils. You could expect them to have possibly been exposed to something that's activated those muscarinic receptors. I'm going to see the killer bees, as I mentioned. This is potentially what's going to kill the patient. If they have overstimulation of the system because again, is anyone going to urinate themselves to death? No. I mean, if you are incontinent, maybe you want to kill yourself because you're just like, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. That was a bad day in class. Don't worry about it. Um, but again, that's never going to kill the patient, right? But these things are. So the bradycardia, right? So again, if you're not able to perfuse the body because your cardiac output is so poor, that's no good. Bronchorrhea, what is that? Bronchial secretion, right? Basically, they drown in their own secretions, right? And they have overstimulation of that. And then bronchospasm, again, helping to decrease the oxygenation uh, there by decreasing airflow. Um, the E is going to be emesis. I mentioned that because, again, you're lowering those sphincter tones, so you can see retrograde movement within the GI tract, lacrimations, so you're going to have a lot of tearing, and then salivation. So if you have a patient showed up and they're just basically, they're crying, they have a lot of, they're drooling, they're incontinent of stool and urine, you would think, hey, wait a second, this looks like the cholinergic toxidrome. Right? This looks like what a cholinergic muscarinic sort of effect would look like uh, in overstimulation. You can expect that maybe something, a substance that's interacting with the system is, is to play here, right? Now, there's also the nicotinic effects. So it's going to happen when you overstimulate these. Now, remember the nicotinic effects we haven't talked a whole lot about in terms of the actual direct organ involvement, but remember these are involved with all of the kind of middle of the road, sort of like the, the presynaptic sort of uh, activation, right, around the ganglion. So here what you're going to find is I use the days of the week to remember this. So I have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday is a little bit of a fudge, but then we also have Friday, right? So, so looking at the, the effects here, the mydriasis you can see. Why do you think you see mydriasis with nicotinic effects? remember, they indirectly activate norepinephrine neurons, right? It's not indirectly, but they directly activate those norepinephrine neurons. So you can see some sympathetic effects coming out of this because of those presynaptic neurons being activated, right? So in this case here, you're going to see mydriasis. You're going to see tachycardia because of that. So again, um, and again, these are the same, it's the same acetylcholine. It's just a matter of which receptors are hitting there. So you can see tachycardia. You can see weakness. Now, what do you think you might see weakness associated with nicotinic overstimulation? Because we said before, nicotine normally does what to the skeletal muscle? Yeah, it activates it normally. So why, why do you see weakness? Overstimulates it, right? Remember we talked about desensitization of receptors can occur? The same thing happens here. And I actually had a baby uh, not too recently, a five-week-year-old, a five-week, five-week-year-old doesn't make sense, five-week-old <laughs> was exposed to um, a refill uh, container of nicotine for like a, a vaping device, right, a Juul or something. And so it was a very highly concentrated nicotine. Kid accidentally got some, and they started to develop some of this weakness. The baby got very floppy because they overstimulate the nicotinic receptors. They desensitize, and then you can lead to that weakness, which ultimately can turn into paralysis, right? Why is that bad? What muscle do you really need to keep working in order to maintain life? You do diaphragm, right? So, again, your heart's not really going to be affected here so much because it's not really skeletal muscle, right? It's cardiac muscle. Not the same kind of innervation here. But you're going to find that weakness is going to uh, eventually lead to diaphragmatic paralysis. Your intercostal muscles become paralyzed, and then you stop breathing and you die, right? That, again, this is why it's really important when we're intubating patients. We actually do something kind of similar that overstimulates the nicotinic receptors, and it causes that weakness and then paralysis, and then I can go ahead and get the patient intubated, okay? We'll talk much more about those later. But... 
So you can see that. Um, that kind of goes along with Friday, which is the fasciculations. That is from the initial activation of the nicotinic receptor. So you may see them kind of be jittery, have, the, have some fasciculations, and then eventually that will then turn into that weakness and then eventually paralysis, okay? And then for Thursday, I say it's Thursday for the ladies, but uh, it's a budget. Um, so it's hypertension. You can see with that. Why do you think you see that? Hypertension. Because again, you're kind of indirectly uh, activating the sympathetic nervous system, and that's causing those alpha receptors to be activated, and you can see hypertension. Okay. So again, those are the nicotinic effects of the days of the week. The muscarinic is going to be the dumbbells. Okay. So you remember that because it's going to come up over and over again. And I'll say when we get into farm one, I'll remember when we talked about that, and you'll say no, and I'll say uh, I have a video proof of it. We did talk about that. So anyway, um, the anticholinergic mnemonics. How do we remember? the anticholinergic effects are going to be here. And so this one is a little bit more, um, you know, not necessarily uh, an acronym so much, but it's more of kind of a saying, but you get this blind as a bat. What do you think you get blind as a bat? So what happens to the pupils? An anticholinergic. And this is anticholinergic. Actually, it will dilate, right? So you're going to see my dryasis associated with that. But blind as a bat is because it impairs accommodation, right? So it's a hard time uh, accommodating for things either in far away or close up, and so you have a hard time seeing. Imagine anyone ever had their eyes dilated for an eye exam, and you couldn't really like, drive home. You couldn't drive yourself home because you couldn't really accommodate very well. They probably use an anticholinergic in order to get that exam done in order to dilate the, the pupils effectively, okay? That's one thing you might see there. Uh, red as a beat, why do you think you'd see that? It's not as intuitive. You can kind of see a lot of flushing. So again, you can also see that they tend to get hyperthermic when they have an anticholinergic on board. Um, so they get red as a bee. So you can see that cutaneous flushing basically trying to dissipate some of that heat there. Um, mad as a hatter, what does that mean? Hmm? Irritable. Irritable, that could be irritable. What else? They tend to have altered mental status associated with this. A lot of anticholinergics tend to be abused for euphoric purposes because you can induce euphoria, hallucinations, all kinds of good stuff, um, but they typically are going to be altered to some degree, right? Now, if you think about, there's a lot of drugs, especially over-the-counter drugs that have anticholinergic effects. Benadryl is a really big one, like diphenhydramine. Again, when you take normal doses of diphenhydramine, what's a common side effect? Yeah, you get a little drowsy. When you start to go well above that, that's when you start to overdrive that system, and you actually end up seeing increased excitation. You can see the hallucinations. You can see the seizures, eventually death from that. Um, so that Madison Hatter is where that comes from. Okay. Now Madison Hatter is actually referring to what toxicity? Anyone know? It's actually mercury toxicity. So Madison Hatter comes from what book? Oh, Alice in Wonderland, right? It comes from the Hatter. Um, actually, when they used to um, uh, the process for using furs and things like that uh, for making the hats, they used a lot of mercury, and mercury is extremely neurotoxic. Uh, and so they were getting uh, basically ultramental status from the mercury uh, poisoning. That's where the Madison Hatter comes from because they're using so much of the stuff. Uh, but anyway, so we use our, our purposes here as an anticholinergic, though. So again, a little bit of a little bit of fun trivia, if you consider that fun. <laughs> dries a bone. Why does he dries a bone? Yeah, blocks all the secretions, right? So again, if I had someone who had abused an anticholinergic or I was suspecting it, they typically are going to say, "Yeah, I can't really go to the bathroom. I can't urinate. I'm constipated. Um, you know, they're complaining of dry mouth, dry eye." Because again, they are completely dried out. This is the exact opposite effects of activating those muscarinic receptors. Okay, and then finally, hot as Hades, hot as the hair, whatever you want to say. Um, typically, that is due to the hyperthermia they're going to develop. Okay, so they typically get very hyperthermic. Since some patients get up in like 104, 105 temperatures, um, uh, so it's pretty significant hyper, hyperthermia there. And then finally, the heart runs alone. What does that mean? Yeah, they get tachycardic, right? So just like we mentioned that by activating muscarinic receptors in the heart, that's going to cause bradycardia. The exact opposite happens here. So you see tachycardia associated with that. Okay. Unfortunately, there's not a nice um, sort of um, mnemonic for uh, uh, the sympathetic nervous system. But again, you can kind of think about someone who is in a fight or flight response, kind of intuitively know what that looks like. They're going to be hyperthermic. They're going to be diaphoretic. They're going to have tachycardia, hypertension. You got to know that, right? If you ever think about someone who's like, on cocaine or amphetamines or something like that, you kind of intuitively know what that looks like. So, um, and again, as I mentioned with tone, both of them are constantly active. It's just a matter of decreasing or increasing activity to see which ones are going to be more prominent. If the receptors are in both the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, how come with the stimulation we get a lot of sympathetic effects? Of the nicotinic effect? Correct. Yeah, because again, they're hitting those presynaptic neurons. They're over, they're stimulating that, which then stimulates that sympathetic effect there. And then what about 
Yeah, so you can actually see uh, the same thing, right? Because those nicotinic receptors will also get activated. So I'll give you a good example. There's, um, anyone ever heard of like VX nerve gas or sarin nerve gas? Yes. Is it like where they spray people and they can die from the toxins, the sarin toxins? Yeah, exactly. So if you ever, I think there was um, some chemical attacks in Syria within the past couple of years or so that was using uh, VX gas or sarin, one of the two. Um, and whenever seen that move the rock? No? Oh, please do yourself a favor. Go see The Rock uh, immediately. Don't just skip class the rest of the day. Go, I'm, not, I'm kidding. Don't do that. At some point, go watch The Rock. Um, anyway, there's a there's a scene where they're using VX nerve gas, and one of the little pellets falls on the ground and breaks open, and the guy's face looks like it's like melting off. And I was always thought like, oh, that's what that drug does. Like, like I was so excited. And then when I learned what it really does, it, it's not. It doesn't make your face melt off, unfortunately. I was very disappointed. But point being is it actually does. Uh, it works as an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Okay. So by blocking the effects of acetylcholinesterase, what does my acetylcholine levels do? They will go up pretty dramatically, right? Because again, I don't have the enzyme there to break it down, so it just sits there in the nerve terminals activating both nicotinic and muscarinic. So to illustrate the effects here, early on, actually what you end up seeing is that the nicotinic effects actually take over. So very early on, it may show up with my dry system, it may show up with tachycardia, those sympathetic sort of effects, and then eventually the muscarinic gets overwhelmed, and then that's when you end up seeing they come in with bradycardia, their secretions are going everywhere, um, uh, bradycardia takes over, you know, so you can end up seeing that. So sometimes it, it depends on the clinical evolution of the case as it goes on, depending on the substance you're dealing with, et cetera, right? So again, sometimes it's a balance between the two. It's hard to always determine which one is really kind of more pro prominent at any given time. Yeah. Okay, so Ways to affect the system. How, how can I do this, right? So I can have sympathomimetics. What do you think a sympathomimetic means? Mimics the sympathetic nervous system, right? So I can have things that directly stimulate those receptors, right? So I can give dopamine IV and it will activate alpha and beta receptors, right? I can use that to raise blood pressure and cardiac output. I can give norepinephrine IV and that will help to directly stimulate those receptors. That's why we call them sympathomimetics because they, they mimic the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. Well, I can do other things too, right? So what if I could increase endogenous release of our own catecholamines? Well, that's where a lot of our illicit substances come into play, like cocaine and amphetamines. They'll actually directly stimulate release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. That's why when someone who abuses cocaine shows up in your ER, are they nice and chill and relaxed? No, they're probably going to be kind of violent. They might be trying to fight you and they're hyperthermic and tachycardic, hypertensive, because they are directly releasing their own catecholamines due to the effects of these drugs here, okay? It also directly stimulates the release of dopamine. What do you think that does? So it causes the addiction, right? That's why people like cocaine so much, because like, they feel so good on it because of that dopamine release um, coming out from those vesicles, right, and those, those uh, neurotransmitters. So that's one way you can do this, uh, affect the system. Well, I can also maybe decrease sympathetic activity, right? So I could do things like blocking adrenergic activity, right? So blocking epinephrine, norepinephrine, and that's where things like our beta blockers come into play, our alpha blockers, and clonidine, as I mentioned, is an alpha-2 agonist, actually will decrease the effects there. Uh, another name for that is called a sympatholytic. So there's sympathomimetics, which mimic the effects of the uh, sympathetic nervous system, and then there's sympatholytics, which will actually decrease it, okay? And then getting into cholinergic substances, as I mentioned, you can have things that will block the activity of the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. That way you have increased levels of acetylcholine. You expect to see increased muscarinic and nicotinic effects. And then I can have anti-muscarinic drugs, which I've kind of alluded to already, right? The matters of had or dries a bone, mnemonic. Um, or in the cases of nicotine, I can actually overstimulate those post-ganglionic fibers and actually end up seeing stimulating effects. So as I mentioned, that baby that was exposed to that nicotine specifically, um, one of the things we would be looking for would be overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. So I'd be looking for things like hypertension. I'd be looking for things like tachycardia associated with that. Um, this baby actually only ended up really manifesting with the, the musculoskeletal effects, right? So they got kind of floppy, they kind of returned back to normal and they get floppy again. That's why they got into the ER in the first place. And we suspected it was nicotine toxicity, right? Anyway, so a lot of different ways to interact with the system. You're going to find that we have lots of drugs to do that, which we will talk about at great length next semester, right? Any questions on that that I can answer? If not, let's do a quick 10-minute break. We'll come back and then do our review.
All right, if you have low blood pressure, normally would albuterol make you pass out? Um, not normally, because albuterol is, is normally given as an inhaled product, and so it's good because it mostly just works in the lungs, right? So you don't necessarily see a ton of blood pressure effects. However, if I were to give like really big doses, um, so if I had someone who has significant um, uh, like status asthmaticus, right? So again, they have a very difficult to treat asthma attack, and I was having them admitted to the ICU, and they're getting a ton, ton of albuterol. You could definitely see their blood pressure get a little lower. They could get a little dizzy, right? So certainly you could see that. Uh, all right, for the second part of the prescription writing assignment, page three, medication order writing rubric. Do you want us to rewrite for the same cases? Um, no, so that second half of that is for the inpatient orders. That's going to be used later on. I just kind of include it all in the same rubric. You're mainly just going with like the actual prescription writing um, portion of the first half of that, okay? So like the example that has like metformin, that's the one you're kind of going, working off of. That makes sense. Everyone clear on that? Later on, we'll have scenarios where like, you're writing for the ICU and you're writing orders for blah, blah, blah. That's where that, that second portion is going to come into play. So, Okay, uh, getting into the Kahoot. Let's go ahead and start this off. Uh, if anyone else wants to join in, feel free. Got a celebrity here. Okay. How long does a drug company have to make uh, money off of their patent before it expires? Um, keep in mind, if I have like 58 responses... Uh, and I'm waiting for those last couple people and there's like 30 seconds left. I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to move on. I think you should have confidence in your answers and go with the gusto. And plus we got other places to be, right? So what do we think? Oh, I cut off the music. I don't like the music. I want to hear the sound of your brains working, right? Very good, yes. So uh, remember they have 20 years from the time they actually uh, submit their investigational new drug application, the IND, to the FDA once that clock starts. Now does that mean they get to put the drug on the market for 20 years as a brand name? No, they have to go through all the clinical trials, right? So they have to go through all of that in order to get to the point where they can actually sell it, uh, and then they can make some money. So if it takes them 15 years, to get their drug out in the market, they may only have five years in order to actually make money off of that, right? That's why a lot of those like um, those enantiomers and stuff are so nice because, or they like them because they can put a new drug out there for that 20 years, um, and a lot of the safety data is kind of already taken from the the racemic mixture, right? So it's kind of a, a little bit of a cash grab in some cases. But yes, 20 years is that time frame they have there. Very good. <laughs> Who knew Hannah Montana was such a farm whiz, right? <laughs> All right, which of the following is not required but recommended on a prescription for safe use? We have medication brand name, PRN indications, strength of the medication, or the provider signature. It's not required but is recommended for safe use. You can look on that TV screen too if you need some extra. Easier. All right, I'm going to skip. So you didn't get your answer in. Okay, so a couple of different things here. So, what is nice to have on there? So, provider signature and the strength of the medication required? Yeah, it's absolutely required there. Medication brain amp is not necessarily going to get you a lot of bang for your buck in terms of uh, safety purposes, um, mainly because, um, you know, in some rare cases it may help if there's like, you know, a brain name that has different formulations of the same ones. I mentioned that Wellbutrin XL, XL and SR, um, but not super commonly it's going to be able to help. The PRN indications though, absolutely right. So because when the patient gets that bottle and it has the, the instructions on there, they want to know what to use that medication for. It's as needed, but what for, right? So because as needed for diarrhea, as needed for... Um, um, emesis as needed for whatever the case may be, right? So that's a really good to include that. And again, it's not required, but I really recommend including that in all your scripts anytime you have a PRN indication. And actually, um, Joint Commission, they're making a big deal of this on the inpatient side as well, because, you know, you may think, okay, morphine, well, of course, we're giving that for pain. But if you're making the nurse decide that on her own, that's actually outside of her scope of practice, right? And so they look at that as like independent prescribing when the nurse is making the call, even though most of them are very well versed and they know exactly what they're doing very good at what they do. Joint Commission says no go, right? I actually had some issues with this where we were having to put very specific indications on our pain meds and I had this one really grumpy orthopedic surgeon I had to call and I'm like, hey man, like you're, uh, or hello physician, um, like you're, 
I don't actually like sometimes not that, quite that conversational. So, hey, you know, I, I need some PRN indications on these medication orders to let them know when to use morphine versus when to use oxycodone and when to use Tylenol, right? And he's like, well, my nurses know what to do. There's a few more expletives mixed in there. Um, so my nurses know what to do. Gosh darn it. Um, and I was like, yeah, I, I know your nurses know what to do, but like, you know, this is a joint commission thing, right? So they come in and they see a bunch of orders where the nurses are making independent calls on what to give, even though they are certainly well-versed on what to do. Um, they see that as independent prescribing and that's no good, right? So that's why we like to be very explicit on our instructions. So that way everyone knows when medication should be given, right? Okay, up next. Metoprolol or toprol is considered a beta blocker. How would you classify this drug is an indirect agonist, a competitive antagonist, an agonist, or an inverse agonist. The beta blocker. A little more serious, I think. <laughs> I think I got two more holdouts, two or three more holdouts. And skip. Oh, good. Last one got in there. Okay. Very good. Yes. So it's a beta blocker, right? So again, it assumes that you're preventing beta receptors from being activated. So based off what we were just talking about, if it's a beta one antagonist, what is that going to do to my cardiovascular status? Decrease heart rate predominantly. What else? What do you think happens to blood pressure? Overall, that will lower as well, right? So we can see metoprolol, a beta blocker, being used for both hypertension and also to help get the heart rate down. If you have someone who had like AFib or rapid heart rate, you can get that down with metoprolol, right? Um, an agonist, though, would be doing what? It's actually stimulating the receptor to cause whatever effect. So if I stimulate a beta 1 receptor, you'd see what happen? increased heart rate, maybe increased blood pressure due to that cardiac output, you'd expect to see that. Um, an inverse agonist is not something we really talk about. It's actually where it will interact with the receptor and actually cause the opposite effects. It's very rare that you would actually ever see that. There's some chemicals that do this where, um, for instance, like, you know, like GABA receptors, like what does GABA do in the, in the brain? Inhibits everything, slows everything down. So if someone has a seizure, I give them something that activates GABA and actually will stop the seizure. Well, there's a, a substance you can actually give that's called picrotoxin, where if you give it to them, it's an inverse agonist at the GABA receptor. And what do you think it causes? Seizure. Yeah, basically it causes the opposite effect and causes all those neurons to start firing off and cause intractable seizures. Obviously not a very popular therapeutic agent. We don't like to do that to our patients, right? Okay, moving on. Which of the following differentiates a toxicant from a toxin? Kind of goes back to our definitions here. Toxin, or toxicants are harmful. Toxicants are non-biologic in origin. Toxin, toxicants are not, I'm sorry. Toxins are non-biologic in origin, or most pharmaceuticals are toxins. You guys really like the music that much? I do, yeah. Yeah? yeah. It's, it's, right, it also lets you know how many people have answered. All right, because you're so all you, It's more competitive. Huh. <laughs> and I'll take that under advisement for next time. That's it. I got to get in. Got to get my answer in. Okay. So the main differentiator between a toxicant and toxin is what? Toxins are example. What are some examples? Snake venom, yeah, like snake venom, it'd be spider venom, uh, botulism, botulinum toxin is a toxin because it comes from a biologic origin, right? Um, on the flip side, toxicants are usually kind of everything else that's non-biologic. So lead would be a toxicant. Um, any most pharmaceuticals would end up be considering uh, toxicants. Again, clinically, you may find the terms get used interchangeably, and most everything probably gets called a toxin. Um, but again, it's sometimes good to know the actual differentiation between the terms there, right? And they're not harmful. They can all be harmful, right? Anything can be harmful in the right dose, right? Well, what does that differentiate it from a toxin? So both are harmful, so it doesn't really differentiate it, right? Oh. Yeah, so again, what was the difference between the two? And mainly it's just that biologic origin, whether it's yes or no, right? Sometimes I will make mistakes on my cahoots, so I'm very uh, receptive to, to feedback on those. I'm like, oh, actually, I did screw that up. My bad. Um, but again, it only affects the people who are, you know, may get that free answer at the end. So let's see. 
Anyway, for cocaine, which of the following routes of administration do you think would have the fastest onset of action? Do you think it would be inhaled, injected, ingested, or insufflated? What is insufflation, you ask? You remember we talked about that? So we snort it. <laughs> This morning. What is Co that? Cocaine? Flonase. Oh, okay. Insufflated flonase. That's good to <laughs> clarify that. <laughs> I thought it was obviously flonase. Like, sure. That's really like the most common insufflation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's got to be. Adderall's pretty popular, too. Be it insufflation? Yeah. What? Don't do that. It's a bad idea. crazy. All right. Moving on. Oh, that's probably yeah, so actually, so this is an interesting thing. So in some cases, you actually find that the kind of non-intuitive route tends to be the fastest. So in this case here, it's actually inhaled. Why do you think inhaled cocaine works that much faster than, say, injected cocaine? Physically, think about the, the where it has to go, right? So cocaine gets absorbed from the lungs. That blood then goes where? It goes to the left side of the heart and then to where? Then to your brain, right? Versus if I inject it into a peripheral vein, it has to go all the way up through. You remember, the vein is slow, typically a little bit slower than arterial, but it goes up through the right side of the heart. It has to go to the lungs, then back to the left side of the heart, then to the brain. So you typically find that inhaled cocaine uh, actually has a much faster onset of action. That's why crack cocaine tends to be much more addictive, they think, is because it kind of stimulates much more dopamine release because the onset is so fast. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I was just going to say, generally speaking, does that mean that inhaled things go in faster than injected, or it just depends on what? It depends on how good, how well it gets absorbed from the, the lungs, right? So, for instance, like albuterol doesn't have like great absorption from the lungs, so you get mostly just local effects, so like steroids in the lungs don't really cause a whole lot of systemic problems. Cocaine, though, happens to be really readily absorbed from the lungs, so, right? So, it's a very drug dependent. Yes, ma'am. Yes, so again, when you're uh, inhaling it, right, you're actually, actually is getting it into the lungs, right? Via, usually you're uh, lighting, you know, uh, heating it up in order to get it so air vaporized. Um, on the other hand, though, when you're insufflating it, when you're snorting it, what's where's the absorptive surface? It's nasal mucosa, right? So again, that's where you're seeing much more of those effects. And then, there, you know, it is bypassing first pass effect, right? It doesn't have to go to the liver necessarily, but you tend to find it's a little bit slower absorption because again, it has to go into the, uh, the venous flow uh, in order to get to the brain eventually, right? So probably injected would be like second fastest and then uh, insufflated would be a little slower than that. And then ingest is actually the slowest out of the bunch and actually end up losing some. Why would someone ingest cocaine? <laughs> Usually they're, they're body stuffers, right? So if someone like sees the red and blue lights and they're like, oh boy, if I get rid of this cocaine, they, they may ingest it. And so that's where sometimes we'll see oral exposures to cocaine. But it's not, not one of the typical routes if you're using it for abuse purposes. Again, the fun stuff you learn in pharmacology. Okay, a drug is removed from the market after noting increases in mortality. What phase trial was this in? Is it phase two, phase four, phase three, or phase one? Actually, so it says removed from the market, meaning it was on the market, meaning people were able to get prescriptions for it, right? What phase trial is that? Phase four, right? Remember, there's three pre, uh, there's three clinical phases of trials, right? Phase one is typically doing what? Do you using healthy people, sick people? You do it in healthy people, usually a small number of people, maybe dozens. And what is the purpose of those studies? safety and also getting the kinetics of it down, right? Because again, before they have that IND, before that 20-year period starts, they have to test in animals and whatnot. They have an idea of how it will, it will work, but they've never used it in people before. So that's what that phase one trial is for. Phase two involves what kind of people? People with the disease state in question, right? 
And then again, you're testing for what kind of dose should we administer to these patients? How effective is this drug going to be? Phase three is when you expand it out even further, right? And giving it to maybe thousands of people, depending on the, the, the disease state. And then once it's on the market, that's considered phase four, right? Because again, anytime you take a drug, you are technically a willing participant in a phase four trial, right? That's, we still monitor for things like side effects and maybe only one in a million because that's the only time we're giving it to millions of people essentially, right? Okay. Moving on, uh, inhibition of CYP3A4 by grapefruit juice would cause which of the following outcomes? It would cause rhabdomyolysis due to elevated levels of simvastatin, or would it cause hyperlipidemia due to lowered levels of simvastatin? The drug we use normally to lower serum cholesterol and is metabolized by CYP3A4. Do we think the levels would be higher or the levels would be lower by the introduction of a CYP inhibitor? Yeah, 50-50 shot. Uh, oh, it's going to be more in your favor. Or less in your favor. All right, let's see what we think it is. Wow, almost a complete even split there. That is impressive. I couldn't have done that with a quarter. Um, so let's look at what's happening here, right? So, so simvastatin based off the premise of the question, is metabolized by CYP3A4, right? So if I have an inhibitor of CYP3A4 on board, if I introduce that, what happens to the metabolism of simvastatin? It will decrease the metabolism of simvastatin, which will cause levels of simvastatin to increase, right? So it means the levels will be higher, meaning you're more likely to see that rhabdomyolysis occur, okay? And it's a very important drug interaction to keep in mind um, for those elderly patients, because again, we can see that uh, as a, you see hepatotoxicity, the rhabdo, it's no good, right? What's a rhabdomyolysis? It's that breakdown, breakdown of the muscle, right? Why, why do we care about that? So you usually want to keep your muscles intact, but also it can lead to kidney failure potentially, or all that myoglobin gets filtered through the glomerulus and it can uh, uh, precipitate out and actually cause acute kidney injury, renal failure, need for dialysis, et cetera, right? All right. A 40 kilogram patient is given 100 milligrams of a drug and they have a concentration of 16 milligrams per ml. What is the volume of distribution? It would be 16 liters per kilogram, 24 liters per kilogram, 6.25 liters per kilogram, or 0.156 liters per kilogram. So most everyone should have their calculators out, perhaps. Fifteen seconds left. Can they do it? Or have you given up completely? It's a possibility as well. <laughs> and the right answer is 0.156 liters per kilogram. Question is, how do we come up with that answer? Let's work through it. Flip the units, huh? Let's look at this. Say, um, all right. So the premise here is we have a 40 kilogram patient. They're given 100 milligrams of the drug, and then we get the concentration, right? So we know what C0 is. We know what the dose is, and now we got to figure out what the volume of distribution is. So what is the equation that we use? C0 equals their dose over volume of distribution. Remember, if a drug has a high volume of distribution, what does that do to our C0? It would decrease it, right? Because there's less drug there in the blood to actually measure, right? Versus if I had a low volume distribution, C0 would be 
high, and you'd have a lot of it in the blood to measure. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, flip this over. So basically, we're going to say that subbing it out, we're going to say that VD equal to dose over C0, or we could say there's going to be 100 milligrams over what? 16 milligrams per liter. What does that turn into? So let's do 100 divided by 16, you get 6.25. What, now what's my units here? Yeah, because the milligrams are now canceled out, so now I have just liters left over, so 6.25 liters. Now are you done at this point? No, right? I want to get the liters per kilogram units, and so what do I need to do now? Now divide by 40. And when you do 40 kilograms, now you get, right, now you get 0.1. 0 0.156, right? Yeah. And that's what's the units on that? Liters per kilogram. Now, the benefit of getting it into that state is now I can apply that to other patients, right? So now I can give that 100 milligrams to someone else of a different weight, and I can figure out what their volume distribution would be for that patient, right? So again, it's more transportable, more portable to apply to other people. Now, is that considered have a low or high volume distribution? It's a low volume distribution. That's why a lot of it was there in the blood to measure after you give that 100 milligram dose, right? Because, again, it was 16 milligrams per liter was the actual resultant level that we got back. So a lot of it was just sitting there in the blood. Okay. Again, the math I'll give you on the test will be able to be done on your scratch paper. No calculator will be needed as long as you can do simple addition, multiplication, and division, right? Maybe a subtraction or two, but you'll be able to figure it out, okay? Just don't stress too much about it. The best way to get people from stressing is to tell them don't stress out. Right. Um, all right, which of the following is true about the intravenous route of administration? Is it has a slow onset of action? Medications can be given uh, accidentally, can be removed easily. It has the highest bioavailability, or extravasation means a med is placed into an artery. Which of these is true about the IV route? His last three holdouts, three or four holdouts. Moving on, this is the highest bioavailability. Why does it have a high bioavailability? It's going straight into the veins, right? You know, uh, it's all right there. Does it, does it undergo first pass effect? Bypasses that completely, right? So again, you get the most bioavailability out of that because it's right into the system there. Um, how quick is the onset? Very quick, right? So again, maybe slower than insufflation for cocaine, but for the most stuff, it tends to be one of the fastest routes of administration uh, for a drug. You're going to get very rapid effects. You know, if I give someone propofol or ketamine, a sedative we use for uh, procedural sedations, I mean, within a few minutes, they're going to be completely knocked out, right? You know, so it's a very fast onset. Um, now, what does extravasation mean? Yeah, it doesn't mean it went to the artery. I mean, that can happen sometimes. Sometimes nurses may accidentally place a line into an artery instead of a vein. It's not common. But extravasation means extra vasation, meaning out of the vein. Um, so that means if the, the line was blown, if the nurse went and maybe in too deep and pierced through the vein, um, the drug gets sent down into that surrounding tissue. And right, that can be really problematic for some drugs because that can cause a lot of significant tissue damage. So like dopamine or norepinephrine, those vasopressors, that vasoconstrict, <laughs> if I give that into the surrounding tissues, it can actually cause necrosis of uh, that tissue there. Very, very bad if that happens. Okay. And then medications given accidentally via this route can be removed easily? No, right? That's one of those things where you can always give more drug. It's really hard to take it back once it's in the system. Okay. Actually, I actually had a really good example of this. I had a PA who had written an order for a patient, uh, and this was for um, uh, they had a seizure disorder. And usually when they get admitted to the floor, they'll have a PRN order for Ativan. Anyone know what Ativan does? It relaxes you, right? It's just like Xanax is essentially, but it also is used to treat seizures. Normally, a you know, starter dose for a patient of the size would have been like two milligrams, right? Well, this PA had written for four milligrams. And so I called her up and I was like, hey, you know, this just seems like odd. You know, I was wondering, you know, why are we going with this dose? Normally, we would start with something like two milligrams. And they were like, yeah, um, well, you know, it's weird because like the hospital said that same thing. That they normally start with one or two milligrams. I was like, well, interesting. That's a really good idea. Maybe do, do you want to decrease it perhaps? And she's like, yeah, you know what? It's interesting because you, know, you can always give more, I guess, and, but you can't really take it back. And I was like, all right. And I looked at the name, and sure enough, it was one of my former students uh, from many years ago. I said, that sounds like something I would say. Um, 
Anywho, so we ultimately landed on, yes, let's go two milligrams. And if the patient needs more, we can give more, right? We can always write for another order. We can change the dose later on. Point being is that once you give it, though, if I were to give that full four milligrams and the patient's then completely zonked out, I got to wait for that drug to get metabolized and out of the system versus if we just started with two and needed to give them more if we needed to, then that would have been potentially more appropriate, right? So that's one of the things you'll see with drugs is that you can always give more. It's kind of like a, a magic show. You know, like, do you want to start off your magic show by, like, sawing the assistant in half? No, you want to start out with like maybe a rabbit out of a hat or something, a card trick or something, right? You don't want to show your full hand right off the bat. You want to work up to something, right? Anywho, and especially working at a PTOS, little magic goes over very well for those patients, right? Anywho, um, what's the standard expiration dating on a prescription for a non-controlled substance? Is it six months, 10 years, 30 days, or one year? It's one year for non-controlled substances, right? Which ones would have a six-month expiration date? Which controls? So technically, remember, uh, Schedule Two substances can only be can only have how many refills? Zero refills for C2s, right? You cannot write for refills for a C2 substance like morphine or oxycodone or something like that. Now, there's actually no strict rules on what the um, expiration date is for a C2. Most people just say, okay, well, it's a six-month expiration. Um, obviously, if I were to get a script for like a pain med and it had been written three months ago, and they're just now bringing it up, I would be very hesitant to fill that, right? It would be one of those things that would kind of trigger off my my – uh, my pharmacy sense, and I'd be like, mm, I don't know if I want to feel this for this patient, right? Something weird going on. Um, however, uh, for the threes through fives, certainly you can have up to uh, five refills on that. You know, if we get a total of six months, right, you get that initial fill and then five refills. Um, six months is, is appropriate for those. So three through five for C2s, again, no refills on that, right? And one year for everything else, essentially. Okay, drug A has 100 milligram uh, daily. You give 100 milligrams daily to lower BP by 15%, and drug B, you give 10 milligrams daily to lower BP by 15%. So based off of this, would you say drug A is more potent? Would you say the drugs are equipotent? Drug A is more effective, or drug B is less effective? Again, sometimes I have character limits I'm working with, so that's why some of the questions may seem like I was maybe on a substance mind-altering substance at the time, but it's mainly because I'm trying to fit my character limits. All right, yes. Yeah. So looking at this, which drug is more potent here? <laughs> drug B, right? Because it needed less drug in order to get the same effect as drug A. So you could say that drug B is going to be more potent than drug A, right? Now, which one is more efficacious? You can't really determine, right? Because again, they're getting the same effect out of these equipotent dosages. Uh, maybe if I tried to increase the dose further, I could see if one was more effective than the other, but you can't really determine that just based off the question and the information here. Um, again, we can't also cannot say the drug B is less effective based off of this. Um, however, we can say that, okay, we get the same physiologic change, the same drop in blood pressure at these two different doses, the two different meds, these tend to be equipotent, right? So again, these, this is the dose you have to give in order to get the same effect out of that. Just like if I give 50 micrograms of fentanyl, that it can be equipotent to two milligrams of morphine, right? Doesn't say one's better than the other, it just says that this is how much I need to give to get the same effect out of these two drugs, okay? Well, these are equipotent doses, right? The drugs can be equipotent. Sometimes you can have something like, um, if I was comparing like fentanyl to, to Tylenol, like those are never going to have equipotent dosages. I have to give so much Tylenol, the patient would be dead essentially, right? Because again, it can never have that much pain relief as something like fentanyl. Obviously, fentanyl is more effective for pain relief than Tylenol, but again, you know, it's always apples and oranges at that point, right? Make sense? Okay, continuing on. Let's see, uh, why do graded dose response curves exhibit a plateau at the upper end of the doses studied? Is it because this is when lethality occurs? Is it because this is when uh, we have tachyphylaxis occur? 
Is it because this is all of the receptors that are being bound at this point? Or is it because this is when receptors start to downregulate? Yes. All right. So again, when you're looking at a graded dose response curve, remember every drug will plateau out at a certain point. That's basically when you have enough drugs binding up all available receptors at that point, right? It's not when your patients start to die off. Hopefully you don't get to that point, right? Hopefully. Um, what is tachyphylaxis? That's right. Even if I keep increasing the dose, the I'm never going to get the same effect out of the drug as I did before, right? Remember that example of nitroglycerin, how I can't give it 24 hours a day because otherwise it becomes less effective? This is what I'm seeing here. Instead of that plateau, you'd actually see it start to go back down as the drug is becoming less effective. Now, tolerance, on the other hand, is what? Exactly. So you get kind of used to the effects. To get the same effect, I'd have to give more dose of the drug, right? So again, tachyphylaxis is different because I can't ever overcome that. Tolerance I can't overcome just with a bigger dose, essentially, right? And then when would receptors start to downregulate? If they're overstimulated, right? So an agonist is affecting them, overstimulating them, that causes downregulation. An antagonist would cause the opposite effect and cause upregulation. Okay. Uh, which of the following has an inverse effect on aqueous diffusion across a biologic membrane? Inverse effect here. Difference in concentration, lipophilicity, thickness of the membrane, or surface area. Again, what has an inverse relationship on that flux across that membrane? <laughs> it is the thickness of the membrane. Right? A lot of this stuff is kind of count is actually uh, pretty intuitive when you think about that, that diagram we were looking at. Remember, if it's a thicker membrane, it's going to have a harder time crossing through that, right? Versus if I increase the surface area, what happens to that flux? It's going to, yeah, it just has more surface area to hit. It's going to have an easier time crossing. Think about the GI tract and those villi and everything to increase surface area. Um, difference in concentration, again, the bigger the difference there, the more flux you're going to see because, again, it's just that allowing that passive diffusion to happen more quickly. And then uh, the lipophilicity also will increase. As that increases, you're going to find more flux because it's easier to cross that membrane at that point, right? But if it's obvious, wouldn't it have a harder time crossing the membrane? Well, it's crossing that membrane is made up of lipids, right? So again, it's aqueous in terms of like the aqueous compartments on either side, but it's also to get across that membrane. So that lipophilicity is what helps with that. Oh. Yep. So maybe a little bit confusing from that standpoint, but um, again, it's still considered aqueous diffusion, right? Okay. Which of the following occurs after chronic administration of a competitive antagonist at a receptor? I already gave this one away, I think. The cell will remove receptors from the cell surface. The cell will increase release of the drug metabolizing enzymes. The cell will increase the number of receptors at the cell surface, or the cell will remove all receptors from the cell surface. So we have a competitive antagonist. What do we expect to see as a compensatory response to blocking those receptors? You'd expect to see. I feel bad for this last person, but I kind of skip you. Right. So remember, we have an antagonist sitting there blocking those receptors. So what does the cell do to respond to that? Are they upregulate or downregulate? I'll upregulate those receptors, right? The cell becomes more sensitive 
because it says I'm not getting enough signal here because it's all being blocked, those receptors, so I'm going to increase that number of receptors available, okay? So again, A would happen, or this red one would happen uh, if I had a, a chronic agonist being administered. That's when you see the down regulation, right? Uh, the drug metabolizing enzymes doesn't really happen uh, clinically, and then usually don't remove all receptors, but that would be kind of the process of down regulation to take into an extreme. All right. Which change could decrease the VD of a hydrophilic drug? Dehydration, increased plasma protein binding, increased tissue protein binding, or edema. Decreasing the volume of distribution for a hydrophilic drug. So what's going to be done to concentrate that drug back into that central circulation? So one of the things I do in my cahoots is sometimes I have multiple right answers. Again, I'm not going to do that on the real test, uh, or if I do, it's been a gross oversight on my part, but I try to illustrate points here more than anything else. So, um, yeah, so multiple things can happen to decrease that volume of distribution. So dehydration does what? Well, it basically, you have less uh, the extracellular water outside of the, the that central compartment, so it's going to draw that drug back in, right? So you can see that certainly occur with the hydrophilic meds. What about the, the increased plasma protein binding? Well, if it's bound up to drugs that are in the blood, it can't partition off and go into the, the surrounding tissues there. So that will also decrease it as well. And again, the flip side would be true as well, right? So again, if I were to have decreased plasma protein binding, you'd see increased volume of distribution. At edema, I would see increased volume of distribution. Uh, now, looking at the increased tissue protein binding, what would that do? That would increase the volume of distribution because now it's being bound up in the tissue, right? Instead of being stuck there in the blood. Yes, ma'am. Um, it depends on the drug. Some of them will be bound to albumin, some will be bound to other things. It just depends. It doesn't have to be, but that's one of those things where if a drug was bound by proteins and that increased, then you would see uh, decreased volume of distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Moving on. Close race. Uh, which of these drugs would be safest? The ED50 of 5 milligrams or TD50 of 25? ED50 of 5 and a TD50 of 5 grams? ED50 of 5 milligrams and a TD50 of 500 milligrams, or an ED50 of 5 milligrams and a TD50 of 50 milligrams. Which would be the safest drug? <laughs> Sounds like a controversial answer. Get your answers in because we're running out of time. We have more questions to get to. All right. Wow, interesting. This is why what's so important? Your units. You got to follow your units. Everyone sees it now, don't they? Yes. So, what is the th what's the therapeutic index of uh, this red option? 25 divided by 5? Five? 5, right? So the ratio is 5. How about the yellow? 100. So it's safer than red, right? Yellow would be safer than red, so that looks pretty good. How about for... 10. This one would be 10, right? So again, it would be in between the two. However, this blue option, 5 milligrams versus 5 grams, that is a thousand-fold difference, right? So because of that, that would be a very safe drug. You'd have to give a ton of it before you'd ever see those toxic effects. This is why I think units are so important, right? You may think, oh, you're just a nerdy pharmacist, but this stuff becomes very important, and as it turns out. Okay. In a phase one trial for a new drug, who are the test subjects? I already gave this one away, so everyone should know this. Would it be patients, uh, pregnant patients and children, patients with the disease state, lab animals, or patients without the disease state? Your answer red, you're a monster. <laughs> I 
answer is people without the disease state, right? Phase one is just really trying to find the kinetics of the drug and looking at safety. They're not looking at the efficacy of the drug. That's going to be for phase two and three <laughs> when you start to hit uh, questions of efficacy, and that's when you give it to people who have the disease state in question, right? These are healthy individuals in phase one. You have your answered red. I feel sorry for you. Don't do that. Don't do that to pregnant patients and children. Why don't we do studies in those, in those populations? They're extremely at risk, right? So again, imagine anything you give to a mom could potentially affect that human being for the rest of their life. That's why we don't do a lot of studies in pregnant patients, okay? Okay. The hotness or spiciness of a pepper is rated by what scale? Hmm, is it the Pemberton scale? Is it the Payne scale, Scoville's, or the Child Pew scale? This isn't going to be on the test, but I just thought it was interesting. Like, when do we talk about this? real. Hmm? I, didn't, I didn't teach you guys this. It's sometimes I do trivia questions. This is barely trivia. This is like really important to know. Yeah. Shh. Rope it in, rope it in. All right. It's actually the Scovilles. Yeah. So if you ever have like a ghost pepper and it's like 98 million Scovilles or whatever, that's actually the, the rating they use for the spiciness of a pepper. What is, shh, what is the component of a pepper that makes it spicy? Capsaicin. Capsaicin is actually a drug we use for pain management. You can actually apply it locally to joints and it's good for osteoarthritis. Also, what happens if you get capsaicin in your eye accidentally? It hurts, right? Just like anytime like I chop a jalapeno up or something, I have this weird instinctual reaction to rub my eye all of a sudden. Um, same thing happens, right? So you have to tell your patients to make sure they wash their hands after using the stuff very well, right? Good. Okay. Next up, we have a 70 kilo male that takes 400 milligrams of a drug that has a volume distribution of 2.4 liters per kilo. What is the initial concentration we should get from that patient? 5.7 milligrams per liter, 167 milligrams per liter, 2.4 milligrams per liter, or 0.42 milligrams per liter. Remember, there will be drug dosing questions that are going to be on the test as well. Again, look at your pediatric dosing stuff. It'll be very straightforward. As always, look at the answer choice to see what am I asking? What am I actually looking for? And then go back and read the question. You'll know, have a better idea how to attack it, right? Mm -hmm. Follow your units and you can't go wrong. Well, you probably can't go wrong, but you're less likely to go wrong if you follow your units. So this one's going a little faster. People are kind of feeling more comfortable with it, right? Maybe. Jill, 30 seconds. All right, the answer, yes, very good. Most people got this correct, right? So let's go through it real quick to see how we're actually gonna do all of this. So we have a 70 kilo male, the volume distribution, we have our dose. Now, how do I figure this out? C0 equals dose over VD, right? So our dose is what? 400 milligrams, right? If I don't specify anything about bioavailability, then just assume it's 100%, right? Um, and then now it's divided by our volume distribution, which is what? The 2.4? 70 times 2.4, right? You need to get this in liters in order, because what's our answer in? Milligrams per liter, right? So we need to convert that over. So we're going to take 70 times 2.4. What is that? What is it? Anyone know? 168, right? So 168 liters. I hope you're telling me right. I didn't do it just now. So 400 milligrams divided by 168 liters equals... Right, whatever our right answer is, right? So that one's a little bit more straightforward. So 2.4 milligrams per liter. Right? That was a little bit more straightforward because you have to convert the, the formula around. But again, by knowing, if I were to say, for instance, change the dose, if I were to increase the dose, what does that do to C0? Okay, increase your level too, right? Again, there's a proportional uh, increase you're going to see there. If I increase volume and distribution, what does that do to my C0? Decreases it, right? So good. Uh, is this is a higher or low volume distribution drug. 
high, 2.4 liters per kilogram, right? Good. And because, again, our initial concentration, even though we have 400 milligrams, we only measure 2.4 there in the blood. So a lot of that went out into the tissue. Okay. Okay. Question 20, the receptor that becomes phosphorylated then dimerizes to initiate cellular action is known as ion-gated channel, a tyrosine kinase receptor, intracellular receptors, or G-protein coupled receptor. Like, oh boy, this is the, the first, first lecture we did. It's going to be a tyrosine kinase receptor. Remember, G proteins have that seven kind of transmembrane uh, portions there, and then they activate the G proteins, cause action. Tyrosine kinase is that to be bound by two ligands, two molecules, and they come together, they phosphorylate, and then they cause their action. Um, which one helps to release all the calcium? And that DAG and IP3, that diacylglycerol and the IP3 is going to be the one that helps to mobilize calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, right? And the ion gated channels, what do they, what do, they do? They open up and they allow ions to flow through, right? Maybe allow ions to flow out or in, depending on the situation, depending on what sort of um, neuron or cell we're dealing with, right? So, for instance, GABA channels, when they open up, what do they allow in? They allow chloride to flow in, right? Versus, like, cardiac ion-gated channels usually allow what to flow in? Sodium, sodium, right? So, again, a lot of these things are, again, uh, along the concentration gradient, but it depends on the channel in terms of what they allow through. Okay. A four-year-old, 17-kilo patient with dehydration presents to the ER. What is his maintenance rate of fluids? What's the rule? 4 2 one rule, right? So, okay, why are we going to figure out his maintenance rate? So 68 mLs an hour, 17 mLs an hour, 54 mLs an hour, or 47 mLs an hour? Yeah. Why don't you practice it? You know how to do it. Right there. Mm -hmm. You can't possibly. Uh, I guess you could not know something. You cannot understand it. Know. Usually, the false answers will be um, the distractors will be things where they forgot steps. <laughs> Sounds like me. We're getting steps. Yeah. I'm definitely most improved person out of this cahoot. You think so? Most improved. A lot of improvement going on here. I see. A lot of improvement. <laughs> What do we think? Very good. 54 mLs an hour, right? So the first 10 kilos of that patient's weight turns into 4 times 10 is 40 mLs an hour. And then how much do we have left over? We have 7 kilos, right? 7 times 2 is 14. So I had 40 mLs an hour plus 14 mLs an hour. I get 54 mLs an hour. That's the maintenance rate for a 17 kilo child, okay? Very straightforward. Uh, which of the following methods of dosing may be most affected by extremes of weight in children? Be body surface area based, age based, or weight based? Which should be pretty straightforward too. is age-based dosing is most affected by the extremes of weight. Remember, the downside of using age-based dosing is it assumes all people the same age are the same weights, essentially, right? So you can have kids that are at either extreme, and you're going to find you may be under or overdosing them, as the case may be, right? Now, weight-based dosing helps with that because you're basing it off of the patient's weight. You may still have find some patients who are kind of at the extremes of either end where there may be some issues, maybe giving too much or too little drug. How do we take into account another feature of the patient? You look at body surface area, right? What includes what's included with body surface area calculations? The height of the patient, right? So again, that is even less uh, subject to change just based off of changes in weight. Okay, so it's height and weight based, which is a little bit more exacting. Okay. What type of elimination is pictured here? 
be <laughs> saturated kinetics would be zero order, first order aqueous based kinetics. <laughs> like what? <laughs> Look at this drop of 50% from 8 to, to a 4 in 2 hours, right? What's the half life of this drug? Two hours, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's a consistent half-life the whole way down. Interesting. What kind of kinetics is that? It is first-order kinetics. Very good. Remember, it's the same proportion of drug every unit of time. So every two hours, that drug was getting 50% metabolized, right? 50% was being eliminated. Zero order is different in how? It's the same amount of drug. It would be a straight line if you were to plot it out on there, right? So that curved line is first order. A straight line would have been zero order. Uh, the other two I just made up, right? Um, actually, typically, zero order is considered that saturated. Once you saturate all those enzymes, that's when you switch over to zero order. But again, it's rare that you see that. Okay, the last question. Which of the following categories has the least amount of abuse potential? Going back to controlled substances. Schedule two, schedule one, four, or three. the least amount of abuse potential. You say schedule four, right? What would have even less abuse potential than that? Schedule five. What about schedule six? Doesn't exist. Fantastic, right? Now, presumably one has the most abuse potential, but also what? No medical use. Schedule two has a medical use, right? So it doesn't make sense like marijuana is considered to have the most abuse potential and no medical use. Yeah, so again, this is the DEA, right, where humans are making the rules here. So again, actually, when looking at the addiction potential of marijuana, how does it compare to heroin, even though they're both Schedule 1s? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't even compare, right? So again, uh, sometimes laws don't necessarily make sense, but that, that's the, the world we live in. Maybe we'll, we'll change one day when you guys are up here teaching. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the winner was 1, 2, 3, 4. Who's 1, 2, 3, 4? Fantastic. Great job. Very good. Very nice. Are you ready for your free answer? C. I didn't say which question it would go to. I just said give her a free answer. So at least one question will be C. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I'm gonna. I'm, so I'm going to post the video for this whole uh, class session. I'll also post the Kahoot so you can go back through and review it if you like. It's no problem. Uh, and then let's see. If I know, uh, I know you described the difference between tolerance and desensitization the first time we went through, but could you briefly describe it again? Yeah, so tolerance is, again, where your body gets used to the effects of a drug at a given dose. So, for instance, if I get used to the analgesic effects of an opioid, um, you're going to find that eventually that same dose is not going to be as effective as it once was, right? Because the body's kind of compensating for that. To get over that hump, to get over that tolerance, what do I do? I give it you get an increased dose, right? You can find pa patients who are end-stage cancer patients who are on astronomical doses of drug. They would kill a person who's opioid naive, but is appropriate for them because they've built up that tolerance over a long period of time, right? Uh, versus that desensitization, that's a process of that. That's a part of that tolerance that develops, right? The cells become less responsive to the drug. That's why you see that, it's that homeostasis. Now, tachyphylaxis is also a type of desensitization, but what's the difference between that and tolerance? Doesn't matter how much more drug I give, the effectiveness never really comes back, right? I have to give the body time to recuperate in order to get those cofactors back and whatever other processes back in order for the drug to be effective again. That's why for nitroglycerin, I have to give a 12-hour free period to allow the body to kind of get back to, to normal and then the drug is effective again, right? That makes sense between the differences. So the receptors are affected in both parts of it? It depends. It depends on the drug and how it's working. Sometimes it has to do with the intracellular components. Sometimes it has to do with the receptors. Um, again, it's hard to paint with a broad brush for that one because it could be very drug dependent. Mm -hmm. So any other questions, right? So again, the test is mainly going to be a lot of concepts. It's going to be a lot of definitions. It's going to be some math, right, is going to be on there in terms of like drug dosing. Um, again, I will give you the equation for that C0 equals dose over VD in case you forget it in a panic. That will be present. But you still have to do something with it. You still have to understand how that equation, what that work, how it works and what, what um, you know, changes you make, how that affects the different variables. Um, but any other questions for... Let you guys go. I apologize for going over three minutes, but 
I'll probably release you early three minutes one day. One day. <laughs> Good job. You, you've now finished your first pharmacy course, uh, the full 16 hours. Uh, next semester, guess what? 32 hours to get twice of me, and then uh, twice as much of me. And then guess what for, for Farm 2? 64 hours. Wow, Yay. Hours. Yeah, it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of drugs. So <laughs> buckle up. We're going to be here for a while. So anyway, I'll see you guys next time.